Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Nunon Montairo, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Yale University. Professor Montairo's main research interests are in international relations theory and security studies. Today we'll talk with him about his forthcoming book that addresses three questions related to the topic of unipolarity. Is it peaceful? Is it durable? And how does it impact deterrence? Welcome, Professor Montairo. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Let's begin with a definition of unipolarity. What is it? So unipolarity is a world system in which there's only one great power. So it's different from other world systems in that in the past we've only had systems with two great powers, say during the Cold War, mm -hmm. in which you had the US and the Soviet Union, or before the Cold War, more than two, three, four, five great powers in Europe, the US rising in the early 20th century. And since the end of the Cold War, um, in my thinking, there's only one great power because the U.S. has far more power than any other state. Of course, this is um, mostly a definitional question. It depends how you define a great power. Sure. And uh, some people, most people, will define a great power as a state that's able to defend itself from any other state, from even the most powerful state in the system. I think that's not the most useful way of looking at it because if you look at it that way, you get a world in which today there's seven, eight, nine great powers. Mm -hmm. Arguably today, any state that has nuclear weapons can defend itself. Mm -hmm. And so you'd end up saying that North Korea is a great power, the same way that the US is a great power. I look at it from the perspective of how much power states can project. And the US's ability to project power in a global scale mm -hmm. is much greater than any other states. So I think uh, the US is the sole great power we have today. And the unipolar system is a world, an international system with one great power. Okay, very good. How did you come to write the book? What was your inspiration? Um, I started in graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I, I did my PhD at the University of Chicago and um, I was working on international security topics, looking for a dissertation topic. And I was struck by two things. One, well, first of all, uh, it, it's, uh, for me, it was the most important topic I could think of in the sense that unipolarity is the way the world works today. Mm -hmm. So it's the way the international system works today. It's, if you want, the background condition um, on which states make their decisions. Okay. And looking at what had been written on the topic, a great deal has been written on the topic. I'm by no means the first one to touch it. Um, I was dissatisfied with how the literature um, just focused on great power interactions. And so basically the summary of the literature I could find was, um, well, we had two great powers during the Cold War. One is gone, the Soviet Union. Therefore, there's only one. Therefore, it's peaceful. There can't be conflict because there's only one. And of course, this is right. It's also, I believe, quite trivial. And so I started to look into um, interactions between the one great power we have, the United States, mm -hmm. and other states. And the uh, second um, point that, that got me very interested in this was that since the typical view that you get um, published on the topic is that unipolarity is indeed peaceful, mm -hmm. Uh, I was struck by the fact that the U.S. has been involved in a great deal of war since the end of the Cold War. So the U.S. in the first 200 years of existence, in which it was one among several great powers, uh, was at war for 35 years. In the last 20 years since the end of the Cold War, it has been at war for 12, mm -hmm. so more than half. And it struck me that uh, there was a lot of room for improving our understanding of the dynamics for, that generate conflict mm -hmm. in worlds in which there's no other great power. How did you do the research for your book? I'm still doing it. It's, it's mostly um, research um, on the theoretical aspects of it. So um, mm -hmm. th first of all, because I don't believe we have empirical evidence to prove a theory right or wrong. We only okay. have 20 years of unipolarity. We haven't had any system like this before. We had uh, great hegemonic powers in the past, like mm -hmm. Rome, Imperial Rome, but they worked in ways that were very different. We didn't have a state system. Sure. So they had an imperial dimension that we don't have today. And so it's, it's a rather unique situation, and the, the empirical evidence we have is scant. We have 20 years of evidence. I don't think with that uh, you can prove any theory right or wrong. And so I thought the burden was on the theoretical development. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people tell me, well, if you can't um, prove the theory right or wrong, so you know, why is it that you're devoting yourself to the topic? And I'd go back and say, you know, this is the most important topic I can see today in, in international affairs. And so I started by looking at um, the theories that exist out there that could uh, help us deal with, uh, with um, um, this system mm -hmm. that we have today, with figuring out how the world works with only one great power. 
And uh, I didn't find much about interactions between that great power and other states. Mm -hmm. So I started to explore that, and also with a great deal of attention to the question of nuclear proliferation, because I think that nuclear weapons make a great deal of difference in terms of states being able to defend themselves without necessarily acquiring the same power, say, the U.S. has. Right. So states today can sort of defend themselves in a relatively cheaper way by acquiring a nuclear arsenal mm -hmm. without developing all the um, conventional power that the U.S. has. So I started to look at, um, the, in terms of the question of peace, which was the first one I, I tried to address, how different the world is today in terms of smaller powers not having a potential security sponsor. Okay. So it's a very different world from, say, the Cold War, in which if a state felt threatened by the U.S., it could very likely find a sponsor in the Soviet Union, right. a patron, an alliance, a supporter. Uh, these days, that option is not there. And so by definition, uh, they can't, since there's only one great power, they can't find another great mm -hmm. power to, to sort of prevent an attack or a threat from this great power. And therefore, I think that there's a great incentive for them to acquire the capabilities, the military capabilities, namely nuclear weapons, that would um, guarantee their security and survival. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why is it important to look at unipolarity, especially in terms of the three questions you put forth? So the topic is important, I think, because not only it's the way the world works today, it will be the way the world will work as far as the eye can see. So we will live in a unipolar world probably for my lifetime, at least for three, four decades. Hopefully my lifetime is longer, but <laughs> at least for three, four decades more. Um, and so it's uh, imperative that uh, those of us who study international politics actually devote themselves to studying the dynamics that will take place in these next few decades. Many people um, today uh, think that the U.S. is in decline. You, you have successive waves of what I call declinist literature. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s, there was the fear of Japan rising. Today, right. there's the, the idea that China, China will rise and, and take over. Um, and so I think that um, it's, I, I'm, I'm recalled of Niels Bohr, the prominent physicist, saying that prediction is a very difficult business, particularly about the future. I can't really predict whether China is going to rise or not, but I think whether China rises um, economically uh, is not is not, does, will not necessarily lead to China rising militarily. It depends on how uh, we deal with them. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important because we may, despite the rise of states that are growing faster, because they are at a sort of earlier stage in their development, like China, India, Brazil, um, perhaps Russia will recover, who knows. Um, despite that, we will still have a long period in which we will live. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the three questions I, I asked, and, and you, you, you just asked me back, um, I think those are peace and durability are the most important questions you can ask. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that the system is peaceful, you want the system to be durable. If you believe the system is not peaceful, you don't want the system to be durable. Mm -hmm. So they're interrelated, and those, the answer of the answer to those two questions depends the amount of conflict and the costs and benefits that actually being a unipolar power, being the number one power in the world by a very great different difference like the U.S. is today, uh, the benefits and the costs of that. So whether, in fact, it's a good thing that the U.S. is number one, uh, and how much conflict can we expect as a result of that situation. And then I look at the smaller question of deterrence, narrower question of deterrence, because deterrence is, is a literature that emerged in the Cold War, and it's a technical term, but basically mean, means how do states get to go to war? So if there is a crisis between two states, what has to happen for that crisis to actually result in military conflict? Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of the, as we call it, the micro-foundations for answering the other two questions. It's sort of the micro answer for the other two questions. That's why I look at that. Okay. And what are some of the conclusions you reach in your book? So the first conclusion, which is about the first question, is mm -hmm. that unipolarity is not peaceful. So I don't uh, necessarily disagree with the conventional wisdom that uh, it is peaceful uh, in what concerns conflict about great powers, because of course there's only one, so by definition it's going to be peaceful. Uh, I do disagree, however, in that it is peaceful overall because I think the effect of um, a unipolar structure of the international system on the interactions between the great power, the U.S., and minor powers, 
uh, may result in a level of conflict that will compensate in a negative way that absence of great power war. Now, it's very difficult to um, give more precise answers in terms of you know, how many casualties can you expect? How big will those conflicts go? The war is very unpredictable. So once you get into conflict, I, I bracket that question. Mm -hmm. But it's likely that we will have uh, significant conflict, uh, levels of conflict. Uh, the other um, aspect, the other question, is the question of durability, mm -hmm. uh, which is a question on which there is great debate. Uh, will it be durable? Will the U.S. be forever um, uh, the, the only great power? Will it be uh, the only great power only for a while? Is it an age and then China or India or whoever mm -hmm. it is takes over? Or is it actually a moment that's already finishing because of these days the financial crisis? You know, there's always a, um, a temptation of sort of finding the news of the day and uh, turning them into an argument for sure. U.S. decline. Um, I think that question has um, two answers, and the literature focuses on the first. The people tend to look at economic growth. Mm -hmm. And of course, since the U.S. is not the most populous country in the world, as other countries catch up in terms of economic development, their economy will be larger. Mm -hmm. And it's very likely that the U.S. will not be the largest economy in the world three, four, five, several decades ahead. Uh, but I think the literature misses the second step, which is, well, will that economic power, rising economic power, um, that other country necessarily convert that economic power into military power mm -hmm. and compete with the U.S. and try to, for instance, deny the U.S. Uh, the current command it has over globally, air, uh, sea, space. Uh, the U.S. currently has control of, of what we call the commons. Everything that's not another state is controlled by the U.S. Mm -hmm. and it has around a thousand military installations abroad. Would the rising China try to revert that situation? And I think that um, the answer to that is it depends, is the answer to many questions is depends on the actions of the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends, it's very much in, in the U.S.'s own hands to um, have a policy of accommodation and reconciliation that enables a rising power to actually feel satisfied with the system, to extract from the system the benefits it feels it is entitled to as a result of its rising power, mm -hmm. or whether the U.S. will try to contain a rising power and therefore increase its dissatisfaction with the way the system works, and as a result, leave it to actually convert its latent power, economic power, into military power and try to compete with the U.S. Right. So I think that depends very much on how the U.S. will, will um, behave mm -hmm. in the next few decades. Okay, final question, and you've um, touched on it a little bit, but how does your theory of unipolarity differ from conventional wisdom today? Um, Three points. First, I would say uh, um, I try to argue that, as I said, unipolarity will be the way the world will work for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas I think the consensus today, not the consensus, but the growing trend in the literature is to find reasons for U.S. decline, be it the uh, financial crisis mm -hmm. that somehow will affect the U.S. more than it affects other countries, uh, be it uh, military overextension, the fact that we're fighting a number of conflicts all over the world, true conflicts, mm -hmm. and that um, we are overextended. Those conflicts are not going particularly well, at least Afghanistan, and our military budgets and all of that are overstretched. So a very old, uh, old and, and, and significant argument by Paul Kennedy, uh, my colleague here, that says, you know, great powers tend to overextend and therefore decline. Mm -hmm. So the consensus is on, on, on the growing consensus is on that position. I would say that that's not necessarily the case that you could see the same uh, preoccupation with the rising Soviet Union in the 50s and 60s. You could see the same preoccupation with the rising uh, of Japan in the 80s, uh, huge literature saying we're doomed, they're going to overtake us in right. five years. Alas, they didn't grow in the 90s or in the, in the past decade, very little growth. So that question, I think, um, is I'm more inclined to say we will have unipolarity for a longer time than most people believe. And I would also differ on the question of peace, as I said, not because people are wrong, but because they're not looking at uh, where I think they should look at, which is the, say, dynamics between the U.S. and countries like Iran or Korea. Mm -hmm. Arguably, those will be smaller conflicts than a world war would be, uh, or a war with uh, Russia, World War III would mm -hmm. be, uh, Soviet Russia. Uh, but they can still be important conflicts, and those are mechanisms for conflict that are directly derived from the fact that the world is unipolar. So unipolarity per se doesn't cause any war, mm -hmm. 
but it creates the background conditions that facilitate, that promote certain mechanisms that can lead to war. And it's to those mechanisms that I devote my attention. In terms of the durability question, the mm -hmm. last one and perhaps the most important, um, I think my take differs in that I separate the economic growth aspect of it from the military growth. And if perhaps we can look at the economic growth aspect of, of, of it in terms of other powers rising and eventually uh, overtaking the U.S. Uh, in terms of economic size, power, um, I think that's a separate question from the military power question. Okay. And I try to <coughs> differentiate between both and argue that in a nuclear age, uh, a state can um, guarantee its security and survival by acquiring nuclear weapons sure. without necessarily matching the U.S. power. And that, in fact, if once it has acquired nuclear weapons, it tries to continue to acquire power to the point at which it competes with the U.S., it's actually taking actions that are detrimental to its survival mm -hmm. and security because of the presence of nuclear weapons. So I think those are the main differences. I see. Thank you very much for being here with us today and Thank sharing you. some My of pleasure. your research. For more information about Professor Monteiro and his work, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.